is letting it out, you go free. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Iron Science Teacher. We're here at the Exploratorium on Pier 15 in San Francisco, and we are also webcasting live all across the internet, so you can watch us from wherever you want. Uh, my name is Julie Yu. I'm a staff scientist and director of the Teacher Institute here at the Exploratorium, and I am pleased to let you know that the contestants for today's Iron Science Teacher are participants in our Summer Teacher Institute. They've, they're the best teachers. They've come from all around the world to play and learn with us here at the Exploratorium. Let's hear it for those teachers. <laughs> Iron Science Teacher is based on the original Japanese cooking show, Iron Chef. But in this show, instead of a secret ingredient that they use to cook, they, the teachers will take a secret ingredient and incorporate it into a science or math activity. And then you guys will decide and judge and cheer for your favorite activity and we will crown the Iron Science teacher for today. Can you guys do that? Yeah. Awesome. Let's meet our contestants today. First up, we have a teacher who is taking the middle school summer institute, Michael Gregory. <laughs> hey Michael, can you tell us where and what you teach? I teach at the Ecole Janine Manuel in Paris, France, uh, middle school science. Oh, and uh, just to my students who were in school last week while I was here, sorry I missed out. Hopefully you uh, get excited by the fun things I'm doing here and we'll do next year for all of you. That's right, Michael skipped school to be here, but he's still working. Thanks, Michael. Uh, yeah. Uh, next up, we have also taking the middle school summer institute, Katie Burns. <laughs> Hi, Katie, can you tell us where and what you teach? My name is Katie Burns, and I'll be teaching 7th and 8th grade math and STEM at Marotta Middle School in Stockton, California. Great, from nearby. Welcome, Katie. Third up, we have a teacher taking our Teacher Leadership Institute. So she's been with us before. She's a longtime teacher here at the Exploratorium, Whitney Thwaite. <laughs> Whitney, where and what do you teach? I teach in Menlo Park at La Entrada School, and I teach seventh grade science. Great. Welcome, Whitney. And last up, we have a teacher who is taking our high school summer institute and is also in our beginning teacher program. Please welcome Marta Fuentes. <laughs> Hi, Marta. Where and what do you teach? <laughs> Hi, Julie. I teach physics and earth science at uh, Westmore High School in Daly City. Great. Close by. All right, welcome contestants. Um, next up, we have the, the last thing to reveal, which is our secret ingredient, which I will confess is secret to you, but not to our contestants. So contestants, will you come around while we unveil? This week's secret ingredient is plastic bottles. Plastic bottles are everywhere, and they stick around forever. So how can we use them? So contestants, you're gonna have 10 minutes to prepare your activity. On your mark, get set, go. Cheer them on, folks. What are they gonna do with plastic bottles? <laughs> There's more where that came from, folks. All right, we're taking a look at Whitney Thwaite. Whitney is measuring out some water in a graduated cylinder and she's checking it out, there's her plastic bottle, and she's filling up her plastic bottle. So she's using it to collect some water. Whitney told me that uh, one exciting thing about her life was that she once swam with alligators, Ooh. which may have also been crocodiles. <laughs> um, but today we're gonna see if Whitney um, has, yeah, if Whitney has the courage to swim with the sharks that are the other contestants on Iron Science Teacher. Uh, we're taking a look at Michael Gregory, who has wrapped a plastic bottle in foil and is pounding a nail into it. Um, super dramatically, but successfully and effectively. Um, Michael's claim to fame is that he has twice participated in the world's 
longest canoe race, which runs for over 700 kilometers, which is actually over 400 miles. So that's a lot of canoeing. Can you believe it? I can't. Oh, yeah. We're taking a look at Marta Fuentes, who is wrapping some straw in duct tape. She has a box full of plastic bottles. I wonder what she's going to do with all of those. Uh, Marta told me her favorite food is sauce. Any kind of sauce. <laughs> And so sauce makes her happy. We'll see if she can mix up a sauce with the secret ingredient today to win Iron Science Teacher. And last but not least, we're taking a look at Katie Burns, who is drilling a hole in one of the two liter plastic bottles. Um, Katie is a longtime fan of the Exploratorium. She first came to the Exploratorium in 1972 when she was a kid. That was the Exploratorium at the old building. And her favorite exhibit um, was an interactive tree that lit up when you clapped. It was called the Enchanted Tree. Katie remembers it as a child. Called, she, she called it the clapping tree because you would go and clap. Um, little did she know that 43 years later, she would be the tree wanting you to clap for her so that she could win Iron Science Teacher. All right, contestants, get those activities together. Marshmallows. Marta's, oh, she's snacking on marshmallows. <laughs> What's your favorite sauce with marshmallows, Marta? Chocolate. <laughs> Michael's put his bottle with foil in a box lined with black paper. <laughs> no bribing, that's right. Whitney's getting set up. It's looked like she's added something in addition to the water. Oh, what's happening there? Some droplets falling down. All right, contestants. We're gonna hear some music soon because your time is almost up. Make sure to put those last finishing touches on your projects. Whitney's also brought some Alka-Seltzer to calm the nerves because of all the swimming with crocodiles and Alka. <laughs> all right, contestants, we're gonna count down. You have 10 seconds to finish up. Can we count down? 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, Let's give him a big round of applause, folks. Okay, now let's see what they cooked up. First up, from the Middle School Institute, Michael Gregory. Hello, everyone. When I heard we were looking at plastic jars, I got really excited because one of my favorite students showed me a great experiment with plastic jars as part of my homemade lab uh, project where we're making lab equipment ourselves. So here, what I've made is called a Leyden jar, and it's an old 18th century capacitor that uses the aluminum as a conductor, the water inside as a conductor, separated by plastic as an insulator to store charge on it. So to store charge of it on it, I need to get the charge from somewhere. So you, some of you guys may know if you rub your feet along a carpet, you may charge up with static electricity, get a shock when you touch the doorknob. Unfortunately, we're not in a carpeted room. So luckily, I have a bit of styrofoam here, but I need something to rub against it. Now I looked at the Tribo Electric se series ahead of time, telling me what would work to charge against styrofoam, and I came up with cotton. If only I had some cotton on me. Hey! Is my mic still working? Yeah, yeah, yeah great. Perfect. Thank goodness I was wearing my marinier. That saved the day. <laughs> okay, so now by rubbing my marinier on the 
styrofoam, I should hopefully be able to build up some charge. So I'm just gonna rub it on there for a minute, rubbing nice and hard. And then I should be able to test that it's charged with the back of my arm and feel my hair standing on end. That's a process I just learned the word for yesterday, formication from the Latin for me, which is ants. So it feels like ants on my arm. So I know it's charged there. I have a plastic bottle and a ply plate, which I can charge up if I ground it. It should get an equal and opposite charge to the polystyrene. And then I can transfer the charge onto my capacitor. So I'm just going to do that a couple of times. And I should be able to build up quite a decent amount of Probably why most contestants keep their clothes on for the competition. Okay, so hopefully I didn't lose too much charge with that. And once I get my Leyden jar nice and charged up, I should be able to discharge through a neon tube. So we'll need the lights down for this so we can see it. It's not extraordinarily bright. If you can't see, have a look at the screen. Oh, so I can see it. Uh, can you see it there, Ron? Yeah, I think so. Well, hang on. So we're looking at the little neon okay, tube. Okay, and that was just a small flash. Not, not overly spectacular, so we'll try that again. Okay, we'll, we'll try it out there, and I just need to recharge it. So taking a moment to charge things up again. Okay, and I should be able to feel a nice shock. Yes, that's slightly painful as I do that. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna get about 10 charges worth, so it should be about 10 times more of a shock than if I were to try directly from the polystyrene. Nine and 10. Okay, round two. Everything in place. Now that on its own isn't that interesting. So coming here from France, now I'm going to use the Eiffel Tower in my next prop, and I'm going to use a fellow who was the US first ambassador to Paris in the late uh, 1700s. Anyone know who that guy was? Benjamin Franklin, thank you. He's also on the $100 bill, was also the postmaster of British North America, and in discovered the lightning rod. So the Eiffel Tower, not many people realize, it's actually a 300 meter tall lightning rod. And you'll rarely have a lightning strike directly in Paris. So if I find my masking tape that I hit up here specifically for this occasion. Will duct tape work? Perfect, thank you. Now I should be able to do the same thing but discharging through the Eiffel Tower to me is the ground. And to try and build up just a little bit more charge, because I want it brighter than it was before, turns out wool is even better than cotton. So if only I could find some wool. Thank goodness I was wearing a beret today. So again, charging this up, just getting it nice and charged. And now again, charging up my capacitor, so I'm feeling the sparks there. It's not exciting if it's not painful for someone. <laughs> okay, that's five charges. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now using the Eiffel Tower, lighting up the Eiffel Tower like they do every night.
And, and finally, these neon discharge tubes are a little small, so I'm going to use something a little bit bigger. So this is a fluorescent tube which can be used to light up homes, offices, and the like. So building up a little more power. Now I'm going to need to charge this up really hard. So as I'm charging, I'm just going to turn on this hair dryer. If it works. And I'll try and do this quickly. Can I hold that for you? Sure, yeah. Thanks, Julie. Hair dryer. So just building up as much as charge as possible with my trusty beret. Michael, why the hair dryer? The hair dryer because moisture in the air can dissipate static electricity. So as you guys may notice, San Francisco isn't the driest place in the world. So being right on Pier 15, it's cool for a bunch of reasons, but not so cool for static electricity. So we're just getting this nice and dry as possible, and that should be good there. It should be charged up enough that even just char discharging it from it directly should light up my Eiffel Tower. And we can see that. So now charging up my capacitor. And again, because the pie plate is much more charged from having the hair dryer with Julie's help on it, we can see that charges. And then I'm going to stop doing the Eiffel Tower if we've gotten a good image of that, just to go quicker. I want to get about 20 charges on this. So this is going to get into dangerous levels. Don't attempt this at home unless you're an amazing teacher who knows what they're doing and you have a decent insurance policy. So on that note, Julie, my insurance policy is on this paper. Thank you, Michael. If anything goes wrong, you know who to call. Okay, now as I'm transferring charge, I also need to think. My hands are a little bit dry. I might not transfer charge as well. I wonder if there's any wet part of my body I could discharge to. My mouth? <laughs> Sounds dangerous. My brain is in my head. Well, I guess I'll try it, but if I get any brain damage, I need someone to call my school afterwards, tell them I can't teach science anymore, maybe schedule me for geography lessons. <laughs> Okay, so trying this. Hey, did oh. you guys see the start? <laughs> Don't try that at home, it's not pleasant. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's Gregory, all I have. Thank risking you. life and limb, you came dressed for the challenge using a plastic bottle as a Leyden jar. Thanks, Michael. We're gonna get set up and next up we have also taking the middle school institute katie burns don't forget your necklace I think we're going to take a look at the screen. Oh. Hold on, you are not. Sure, yeah, you know, teachers are used to using their teacher voice, so Kate, the microphones and technology of uh, audio um, is not something in our repertoire. But Katie, perhaps you can project and use your teacher voice. So as I, hey. oh, it came on. That is quite an amazing teacher voice. Awesome. 
So as I always tell my students, anything we do that's new, I always say, this reminds me of a story. And when I thought of our special ingredient today, I thought of a story. And it always starts with my dog, my beautiful dog, Sassy. And this picture is from the day I adopted her at the shelter. She has very sweet eyes, nice fluffy coat, really nice dog. But uh, as I think of her, I don't really think of her in this version. I think of the next picture, which is the next slide, which is that. And so as you can see, she's got all these very sharp teeth and she uses those to puncture a lot of things. And so for example, our next slide, uh, chew toys destroyed. She punctures holes in them where you can't even tell that that used to be a cheetah or a leopard or something. And of course, shoes, but it's always one shoe at a time. And uh, hose, garden hose, irrigation system, as you see on the left. And of course, sometimes she punctures plastic bottles. And so this leads me to a question, which is our next slide. Does it really matter? All these puncture holes, does it really matter? And so I thought I would experiment with that today. So what I've done is I've got some two liter bottles and I've drilled holes in them and I filled them with one of my favorite ingredients, which is water. And so uh, what we're gonna think about today is does it really matter that there are holes drilled in the bottle? Is it going to affect the bottle in any way or its contents? And so I'm gonna get some assistance from an audience member. Um, how about you in the yellow shirt back there? You in the yellow shirt, tell us your name, please. My name is Courtney. And what brings you here to the Exploratorium today? I'm here for the amazing Teacher Institute. And where and what do you teach, Courtney? I teach seventh and eighth grade math and science in Santa Cruz, California. Great, thanks for your help. Thank you, Courtney. All right, so because this involves water and potential you know, calamity with Courtney's lovely hair or her outfit, uh, I'm gonna have her help me by holding a tub. And uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna evaluate an ordinary two liter bottle filled almost to the top with water and what I've done is I've taken duct tape to cover uh, the various holes and right now I'm going to tip the water bottle on its side and as I reveal the uh, openings on the bottle with uh, peeling back the duct tape uh, how many of you think something's going to happen? Oh, how many of you think nothing will happen? Ah, a few of you. So let's uh, check it out. Uh, and so we'll test them one at a time. So Courtney's gonna help me here. All right, so we're gonna peel back to the first hole. Oop, a little bit. Super sticky tape. Okay, as you can see, uh, possibly on the monitor, the hole is exposed, uh, but the water is basically staying in there. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, it's got a puncture, but it's not affecting the water flow at all. So what do you guys think if I peel back another one? You think something's gonna change? Yeah, let's give it a try and see what happens. Ah, two openings, nothing changes. Let's try the third. Ah, so in this scenario, it really wouldn't matter if my dog sassy or in some other way we had uh, put openings in the bottle, the water is still staying in there. So it's kind of magical. Uh, but actually there's a lot of science behind this magic. And so we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. But now I'm thinking, I know I have this bottle on its side. What if I put the bottle up vertically? Would that change anything? So should we take a look at that? Yes, all right. So I'm gonna put the tape back on here. All right. Are you ready? All right. Still be, um, you'll still be friends with me uh, on Monday. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're gonna try starting at the bottom and I'm gonna peel up the first opening and let's see what happens. <gasps> oh. oh, let's try another bottle and see what happens. <laughs> uh. 
Oh, it's really stuck. All right, staying inside. So all the way there at the bottom of the bottle, you've got this opening right here, and the water is just sitting there. So uh, this is actually a lesson in uh, something that we call surface tension. And uh, water molecules, they have this tendency that they want to kind of hold hands and connect together. And when I talk to my students about this, we uh, talk about the game, if you guys have ever played uh, Red Rover, Red Rover, which is where you stand in line, holding hands really tight with your friends, and someone tries to run through and push through the line, and hopefully you can capture them. And the surface tension is kind of doing that. It's holding the molecules together so that there's this even pressure. So as much pressure as there is for the water to come out, there's equal pressure for the water to stay in because those molecules are holding together so tightly. But as in the game Red Rover, Red Rover, you reach a point sometimes where you send over a bunch of people or someone who's really, really fast and uh, exerts a lot of force, and then it breaks the bond. And so let's see what happens when I lift it another time. What do you guys think? Water? Water? Let's see what happens. All right, Courtney. I'm ready. Point it a little in my direction. There you go. Right. Oh. oh. But for those of you uh, who are looking on the screen or here in the front row, what you'll notice is that the water is only exiting one of the uh, openings. So that's kind of interesting. I wonder what happened if I pull it up to the third. Let's see what happens next. Oh. It's water. <laughs> So what's happening here is that you've got a couple of forces that are taking place. You've got the surface tension, which has now been uh, broken because you have the force of gravity that's pushing on the water and the air pressure uh, is also pushing the water down the column of water. And so uh, the surface tension can hold things together, but only for to a certain point. So if you exert enough pressure, um, it'll break that tension and that's why we see the water exiting. Thank you, Courtney. All right, let's try a couple other things. Remember this bottle I had on its side? Can we all agree the water didn't come out? Well, I wonder if there's a way, let's say I wanted the water to empty. Maybe I'm giving Sassy a bath or something. So I wonder how I could get that water out of the bottle. What did you say? Push the bottle in the middle? Yeah. Should we try? Oh. So the pressure I'm putting on, <laughs> I'm putting on the bottle, again, is breaking that um, the um, surface tension. And so the water will come out. And also now, as we get more air in the bottle, that's also going to push down on the water. And that'll cause it to uh, exit the bottle as well. OK. And I have one more thing to look at. Thank you. All right. So this time we'll start at the top. You guys think water is going to come out? No. No? Let's see. So same thing there. We have surface tension, the water staying in the bottle. And of course, if I was to squeeze on the bottle, the water is going to come out, right? So. Another way that I can uh, cause some additional air pressure, which will brace, break that surface tension, is I can open the top. Yeah. Oh. One more time. All right, it works. So I got my own little drinking fountain right here. Lovely, right? OK. Uh, and uh, so as this is happening and I remove or loosen the cap, it's allowing air to get into the two liter bottle. And so that's pushing uh, force onto the water itself, which again, uh, the surface tension, it, it's just a little bit too much pressure. So the water gravity wins out and so it comes out of the opening. 
And uh, last thing that I just wanted you guys to think about, if we go back to this version where we're gonna open the bottom, nothing comes out. What happened when we opened the second one? It came out, right? Just one hole. Okay, let's take a look at the flow of the water exiting the bottle between the bottom and the middle. And you'll notice you've got different curves, different angles that the water is exiting. And that all has to do with that force of gravity. So the water at the bottom of the two liter bottle is it, uh, being pushed at a much greater force because of the weight of the water above it. And so you'll see that that's exiting at a greater force than the water at the next level up. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Right. Let's give Katie a round of applause. <laughs> Showing surface tension versus air pressure with a three hole bottle. Katie, did you bring paper towels? <laughs> Saboteur. All right, hang on to your seats, folks, because you're about to meet the whirling dervish that is Whitney Thwaite. Like bread? Good, because you're getting, ooh, it's all messy there. Well then, I think I need to give you all a piece of bread. Yes. Oops. So, let me just tell you, when they said plastic bottle, I thought of what all of you thought of. A lava lamp, of course. I mean, how many of you have seen a lava lamp before? Yeah, I could stare at lava lamps for hours, up and down, ah. Uh, but I had to figure out, how could I get a lava lamp in a bottle? Have you ever gotten a lava lamp in a bottle? Me neither. So, first, you have, oh, you wanna be my assistant? I'm gonna need you in a minute, come right up here. So, I thought first I need to understand how a lava lamp works, because I didn't really understand how a lava lamp worked. So, I looked it up online and guess what? It's a D word, density. Does anybody know density? Has anybody heard of density before? Well, I like to call it the jam-packedness of something. So how jam-packed is something? So like, for example, what's your name, my young assistant? Gavin. Gavin. Gavin, did you all hear it? Let's give a round of applause for Gavin. All right, buddy. So, Gavin and I are gonna pass out some bread to each one of you, well, to 32 of you. <laughs> one per person, and don't play favorites. Hello, beautiful, this is for you. Hello, gorgeous. Don't eat it, don't eat it, don't eat it. I know it's lunchtime. You can eat it after you're done with what you're gonna do. Here you go, smarty pants. <laughs> yeah, only one per person. Ay, ay, ay. Go back in the back, Gavin. Oh, I see a hand over there wants one. You want one too? Excellent. How about you, number 85? Yes. Yes? Definitely. You're my all-time buddy. I tattooed you. All right, Gavin. Way in the back. Oh, some more back there. Let's sneak through the audience. We got three more. There you go. And one over there. And one way in the back. Oh, sorry, lady. <laughs> All right. So, someone didn't get one. These are my special loaves. Well, I'll get one more for my special loaf. And Gavin, you need one too, so I'll get two. There you go. Oh, but I get, I shouldn't really, no, don't eat it. I should really take one of each so it will be fair. Because in science, we always want our tests and our experiments to be fair. All right, I'm gonna wrap that baby up. Gavin, don't eat that yet. Oh wait, where's the, I thought you were giving that to someone. Yeah, throw it out there, someone will grab it. All right, so I wanted 
to teach you a little bit about density first, right? Density is like a core concept in science, right, Julie? It is very important, yes. Thank you. Um, she's not as dense as she looks. Oh! <laughs> Sorry. What, you gave them both away? Oh my gosh, I should have listened to you, Julie. These younger assistants are not reliable. Take a seat, your turn is over. I know. Thanks so much. They Let's give it up more, for Gavin. More, more. <laughs> Good job, Gavin. All right. I know, you give them a piece of bread, they want a loaf. It's just how it is. Gavin, do not give this away. I'm not even gonna give you the crust. There you go. All right, so well, we're a little off. That one has a few more slices than this one, but that'll be okay. So, remember I told you that density means the jam-packedness of something, how jam-packed it is. So if you look at your piece of bread right now, you can see how much volume it is. How much space does it take? Does anybody know how they can make it take less volume, make it smaller, make it more jam-packed, more dense? What do you think? Squish it, everybody! Squish your bread! <laughs> Julie, this is before. Will you hold the before? Squish it! More, Gavin! Squish it! Squish it! Squish it! Squish it! Squish it! Owen, make it small! Smallerize it! How small can you get your bread? Smaller! Squish it! Make it into a ball! Gavin, more, more! Squish it all together! Look at this! Look at this! Look at the difference, and I'm not even done yet, Julie! I didn't know I was gonna get a workout! Fold it! Oh! Stand up, that is gorgeous. Does anybody think they can get it smaller than that? Oh, nice. Nice. Holy cow. Woo, that's a nice one. Gavin, you're doing well. Uh, now we're gonna have some pigeons, but that's okay. All right. Okay, uh, so here it is. So this is more jam packed. This is more dense now. I knew I had to figure out density to figure out my lava lamp. Can I have my first slide? So. Here's a picture of a lava lamp. What? You can eat it now if you want to. Um, so, I figured with my lava lamp, I gotta understand what's going on in here. So I watched it for a while and this is what I noticed. I noticed that once the thing gets, big blob gets up here, it starts to come down. And once a big blob is down here, it starts to go up. You may be mesmerized by my lava lamp over there and you can see it's, well, it's not doing that too much because now it's way too hot. But this goes up then this comes down and there's a light down. So I thought, well, what's going on in each of those spots? So I have my giant magnifying glass of science. Have you ever seen a magnifying glass that big? She says no. All right, wait, that's not my picture. Can I get my slides back up? No, I need my slides. Yeah, but there we go. So I'm gonna take my magnifying, giant magnifying glass of science, and I'm going to first take a look up here. What's going on? No, I'm gonna first take a look down here. What's going on? Oh, I've looked at the molecular level. Do you see all those molecules? They're kind of, do you see them pink there? So, hmm, I'll take a look at that. And now I'm gonna say, well, what's going on in the upper ones? So I'm gonna take my giant magnifying glass of science and look up here. And, ooh, those are different. Does anybody notice something different between this one and this one? What do you notice, what do you notice? One is way more dense, one is way more jam-packed. You're a quick learner. So I thought, well, maybe I better also take a look at this. So I, oops, wrong side. I put my giant magnifying glass of science to take a look at the molecular level there. And I pulled it and I go, ooh, what do you notice about the jam-packedness of that one? The density of that one? It's kind of what? Yes, it's in between the other two. Look, you're so smart back there and you can transmit that without even opening your mouth. It's amazing. So this one, not so dense. This one, very dense. This one, medium dense. So, but how does it cause, how do we get this one being a different density than this one? So I had to look closer and I saw that that light is also a heat source. And when you heat something up, it gets it excited like it wants to dance. And you know that a bunch of people dancing need way more space than a bunch of people just standing like this. Look at how many of you are in here. Very jam-packed. But if you all started dancing crazy like Julie Yu does, I've seen her before, it's really crazy. We would need a whole lot more space, right Julie? Plenty more space. So 
This gets hot when it's down here, it gets hot and the molecules spread out. Then they're less dense and they rise up to the top. They get to the top, it's cooler up there. They go back close together and they sink down. And it just goes up and down, up and down. Because the difference in, what's the big D word we're learning today? Density. Density. So, I have thought to myself, how am I gonna do that in a bottle? And I talked to Julego, can we get some of that stuff? And she's all, it's toxic. You can't have any. We'll have to get hazmat suits for everyone. So I've got some hazmat suits for everyone. No, she said no. So, I still love you though. Okay. So, anyway, giant magnifying glass of science. So I had to figure out how was I gonna get this stuff down here to all of a sudden be less dense so it would rise. And then how do I get it more dense again so it will sink? And I thought, and I thought, and I thought, and I thought, and then I came up with, oh, look on the internet. And I did. So this is what you need to do. I have this, and this is a science teacher's trusty friend, Alka-Seltzer, it does everything. And you take this. Does anybody know what happens when you put Alka-Seltzer in water? What happens? It dissolves, and then what does it do? It creates bubbles and a gas. So bubbles are very low density. Their jam-packedness is very small. You know, maybe even less than this water. So if I put it in there, the direction said only one half a tablet, but really, this is the exploratory. Let's go for it. Let's do a whole tablet. <laughs> All right. So get a picture of this. It's really pretty. And so it's carrying, the gas is carrying that water up. Look at the picture. Or look at here. It's carrying that water up because it's got gas and water. What happens when the gas and water makes it to the top? The gas pops and comes out here. And so then it's more dense again and it goes back down. Then it gets some more of that gas and comes back up. And then it goes up to the top. The gas goes, pops, and goes back down. And so we've created a different kind of lava lamp, but still works with a pr principle of what? What's the D word? Density. Density. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Give it up for Whitney Clay, making a homemade lava lamp in a plastic bottle. Here you go. And it weighs the same. Amazing. All right, last but not least, please welcome Marta Fuentes. Hello, 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 hello. So um, I teach physics. How many of you have taken physics? Woo! Yeah. How many of you teach physics? Woo! Yeah. OK, so I come from a country with uh, no space program. I come from Chile. And that is my brother. <laughs> so this is, speaking of density, this is the highest density of Chileans you will get in all of San Francisco. This is as jam-packed as we get. Um, so here's the thing about physics. We love uh, pushing things. We call pushes forces, right? So I was thinking about bottles and forces and stuff. So um, I have a friend, his name's Raleigh. And we're actually so close that Raleigh and I are wearing the same shirt today. Uh, you'll know who he is because he has the same shirt on, right? So um, bottles, um, physicists are optimists because is there anything in this bottle? No. Anything in this bottle? No? Yes. Right? It's filled with air, right? But, so it's not empty. It's just filled with air, right? And what happens when I, when I squeeze it? Can you feel the air? Yeah. Yeah, right? So, what we're going to do is we're going to start the Chilean um, space program. <laughs> this, is, this is it. Finally! <laughs> Finally! Right? So, so what are these? No, no, no. These are safety. These are safety. Because when you're in a place like this, with this jump packetness going on, you want to make sure that nobody gets hit in the face with anything that isn't delicious. Right? So, um, <laughs> Can I have some predictions about what's going to happen? Prediction? It's going to launch. It's going to launch? Like far or not far? Not far. Not far? So um, things are coming at you. Act accordingly. <laughs> Ready, set, go. Yeah. All right, all right. So, so that was exciting, right? So I was thinking, 
um, that maybe we could have a little contest, right? So, by the way, if you catch a marshmallow, you can keep it, and at the end of the show, I will trade it for a clean one. Don't eat that one. But I have clean ones, so just hold on to it, and um, it's like a token for a clean marshmallow. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to build two little rockets, and I tried to make them as similar as possible. And you know uh, how we know these are rockets? The fins, right? It's like, that. this is a straw rocket. Straw rocket. Whoa, amazing, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to have these two bottles, right? And these look, these look about the same, don't they? Right? No, they're fine. So let me get two volunteers. You want to volunteer? Let's have, let's have a lady and a gentleman. So let me have this gentleman right here. And let's have this lady right here in the pink. You can help me with something later. I pinky swear and promise. So um, which bottle do you want? Volunteers, can we get your names, please? Oh, yes. Alice. Alice, thank you for your help. Tommy. Tommy, thank you for your help. All right, so Alice and Tommy, um, do you think this is a fair contest? What's not fair about it? Uh, one has more air. Oh, I'm sorry. Say that again, Tommy. One has more air in the bottle and one has less air because one is smaller and one is bigger. Do you feel like this is a fair contest? Yeah, because yeah, you're going to no. win, right? <laughs> you feel it's not a fair contest, right? Because you're honest. Honesty is so important in science. Right, Paul? Okay, so who's going to win? Can we get uh, a cheer if you think the smaller bottle is going to win? Let me hear some claps. My, my cla let, this is my clapometer. Um, and then let me get some cheers for this one. Who thinks this one's going to win? Right, so, so we clearly feel that because there is more air in this bottle, this one will go further than this one. So let me have you guys stand right next to me. And then let's do three, two, one, launch. And when I say the word launch, you squeeze as hard as you can. And is there safety on them? There's safety on them? All right, there is safety on these, but please act accordingly. Still and don't watch your eyes, safety. folks. Michael's insurance policy only extends so far. <laughs> All right, so on the word launch. Three, two, one, launch. All right, so did they go a lot further than each other? No. no. They actually went about the same distance. And if you look at the size of those straws, they were the same size rockets. So like that wasn't different. So, so what's the deal? And here's what turns out to be. You guys can have a seat. Give him a hand. Give him a hand. Yeah, thanks. So it turns out that if you want to push someone, you got to touch them. Right? That, that doesn't seem too bizarre. So in physics, we talk about contact forces and we talk about non-contact forces. And it turns out that if you want to push something, where's my safety? That if you want to push something, you got to touch it, right? So I know this looks like two rockets. It's just, it just has two sets of wings because it's super fancy like that, right? So this rocket is much bigger. So it means that it's going to touch this straw for much longer. So it will go further, or will it, right? So let's test that out. Hurry it up. All right, small rocket. Small rocket. Safety. Here, hold on to that one. Put that one on it. All right. Ah, I already have one on there. Small rocket. <laughs> right? Okay, so big rocket, small rocket. I get to push you for a long time because I'm touching you for a long time. I get to push you for a short time because I'm only touching you for a short time. Should we aim them up at the ceiling? Ready, set, launch. Hey. Hey, right? So it turns out that it's about touching. So then I was thinking, hey, how can I get maybe like a really long straw, right? So, so, so it turns out that this is actually what the Teacher Institute uh, really like teaches us, how to bend and cut PVC pipe, because <laughs> this is like all we do. It's, it's pretty awesome, though. So, <laughs> so this is my friend Raleigh's awesomeness and it is a dual rocket launcher and they're called stomp rockets because you have to stomp on the bottle so i was actually thinking of setting it up here and shooting at those nice folks over there so really long straws uh, 
these have um, duct tape because I tried them with big marshmallows and they're too heavy. So if uh, you catch one of these, they, you also get a marshmallow. So let me have these people here in the front maybe watch your eyes a little bit more. Thank you, Julie. All right. Do you want to come stomp on this for me? You have to jump on it with both feet really hard. Ready, set, launch. Whoops. All right, go. Ready, set, launch. Yeah. Nice. Nice. So then, so then, so then, one last thing. I was thinking, let's be fair. Everybody deserves marshmallows, right? Ready, set, launch. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. That's Mark Fuentes, everyone. Rocket. That's great. All right, folks, we're going to bring out all our contestants, but I want you to think about which was your favorite science activity and perhaps whether you prefer bread or marshmallows. So first up, we had Michael Gregory. Come on back. Remember, Michael used a plastic bottle to create a Leyden jar. Next up, we had Katie Burns who showed us simple pressure versus surface tension activities with a plastic bottle. Then Whitney Thway came busting through with a lesson on density to plastic bottles. And finally, Marta Fuentes with using plastic bottles for stomp rockets. All right. I have in my hand the official sound level meter to determine by the strength of your applause who is going to win Iron Science Teacher today. So can I hear your applause for Michael Gregory? Great. How about Katie Burns? Marta Fuentes. And Whitney Thwaite. I believe the Iron Science teacher for today is Whitney Thwaite. <laughs> With an assist from Gavin. Thanks for coming, folks. Next week, we will have another episode of Iron Science Teacher next Friday at noon with four other participants of the Teacher Institute. Please join us. Have a great day at the Exploratorium. Thanks for coming.